Good morning. I just found 905 and we'll let everyone get settled and go ahead and commence the meeting. The emergency manager directed this public hearing be held and conducted in accordance with MCL 399.203 subsection 2, which provides that not less than 60 calendar days after the transmittal of a preliminary report, the Historic District Study Committee shall hold a public hearing in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Please note that the committee's report is a preliminary report. The report is subject to modification and amendment. The purpose of this hearing is to solicit public input and comment concerning the report. There are, if anyone doesn't have a copy, there are additional copies of the report on the table in the back of the room. If anyone needs an additional copy, we can provide a copy after the meeting if necessary. The report has been transmitted to the following agencies for review and comment. The Planning Commission, the Flint Planning Commission to be specific, the Flint Historic District Commission, the Secretary of State, and the Michigan Historical Commission. In addition, the Michigan Historic Preservation Review Board. My name is Crystal Olmsted. I'm an Assistant City Attorney, and I will be moderating this morning's meeting. I will now ask that everyone rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. During the public comment period, anyone who wishes to be heard on this matter may approach the podium and be heard. Each speaker will have five minutes to comment. At 4 minutes and 30 seconds, I will notify the speaker by raising my hand that they have 30 seconds left to wrap their comments by holding up my hand. Once the speaker's time has expired, I will inform the speaker and call upon the next speaker. We ask that public speakers to share their comments concerning the subject matter of the public hearing. We also ask that everyone in attendance be respectful and courteous. Any individual who creates a public disturbance will be removed from the meeting. A person whose behavior violates the disorderly conduct ordinance may be charged with creating a public disturbance. In August of 2013, former emergency manager Darnell Early appointed five individuals to chair the Carriage Town Historic District Review Committee. Tim Monaghan, Myron Shelton, Sh Sally Jager, Jagger, um, I apologize if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, and John Bordeaux. The committee met once a month and reviewed the western boundary of the Carriage Town Historic District. The particular area that it reviewed is a section of Carriage Town Historic District that lies west of Grand Traverse from Fifth Avenue in front of Hurley Hospital, down to the river and encompassing Atwood Stadium in the Stone Street redevelopment area. The committee submitted its preliminary report to E.M. Early on or about August 24, 2014. 50 copies were provided to the clerk's office for, for public review, as I mentioned earlier. You missed Heather Bernash. I apologize, Heather Bernash, who is in attendance today. Uh, at this time, I will, read, I will read the committee's summary of its findings. Actually, we'll start with the executive summary. From September 2013 through April 2014, the Cares Town Historic District Boundary Review Committee met informally at the Good Beans Cafe for the purpose of interviewing key persons that reside in or, or, or are involved with the redevelopment of the Cares Town neighborhood, the University Avenue Corridor, Hurley Hospital, and Atwood Stadium. Mr. Michael Brown, acting as the, Flint, as, as the City of Flint's emergency manager, appointed the committee. The committee's objective was to develop recommendations that it believed would lead to improving the conditions of a very unstable and quickly deteriorating area of housing, vacant lots, and a few commercial properties. The recommendations of this committee are reflected of a majority of the group. Mrs. Ms. Heather, Heather Bernash strongly opposes moving the boundary. I'd like to make a correction. The committee was appointed by the former EM, Michael Brown, and the report was submitted to former EM, Mr. Early just for clarification. 
A summary of these recommendations is as follows. The City of Flint would actively enforce historic district ordinances and support historic district redevelopment for the purposes of retaining that part of history not already lost. Move the Western Harris Town Historic District boundary off of the goal to Grand Traverse, removing 10 blocks from the current historic district. With the removal of these mostly vacant blocks, the City of Flint should then assess whether the new Carriage Town Historic District now meets the criteria of having enough of the original housing stock to qualify as a federally recognized historic district. The City of Flint should allow Hurley Hospital to remove the eight residential houses they own in the area that has been removed from the historic district for the purpose of stability and public safety. The City of Flint should work with Kettering University, which now owns Atwood Stadium, to quickly allow for the removal of several vacant structures around Atwood Stadium for the purpose and stability uh, and public safety, excuse me. At this time, I'd like to open the meeting up to public comment, particularly people from the committee. Would anyone like to come forward? Carriagetown Historic Neighborhood Association, a 501c3 nonprofit organization who is democratically elected by the Neighborhood Association, has voted to reject the proposal reduction of the historic district boundaries. It is unfortunate that the public hearing for this issue was scheduled at 9 a.m. on a Friday when most neighborhood residents must be at work. The only people who can attend are those with the day off or are here as part of their job. Thusly, we have, we have recorded for your consideration the following reasons for our rejection so that voice, so our very many voices may be heard. As stated by the, state, uh, by the staff at the Michigan State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, the report is based on inaccurate understandings of the, of, of the authority of the Historic District Study Commit Committee, and the district should be re reviewed as a whole and reasonable boundaries developed based on history, significance, and integrity, not on the purpose of use or development intent. The document does not meet any standards for appropriate or legal process. We have significant questions about the composure of the study committee. The process was led by a neighborhood resident that is not a member of the neighborhood association, a non-carriage town business owner, and two individuals listed on the report who did not even participate in the process. These four members have neither constructive or historic preservation credentials. It did not include a historic district commissioner with the historic preservation knowledge and experience. However, instead of using, the, of using this knowledge, the committee excluded her from preparation and review of the report. Actually, it appears that it was authored by one person. Based on conversations with numerous individuals who were quoted in this report, they were either misquoted, not actually interviewed by the committee, or credited with opinions that have not been endorsed or vetted by the, inst by the institutions or organizations. For example, the Fit Flint Public Arts Project sent us an email that states, support or non-support for it, the boundary change. It is not for FPAP's mission as such by connecting places, activities, disuse, disused sites, and transforming the, imaging, transforming the image of the city. The report does not discuss any of the potential negative impacts of the boundary change to the entire district. This, this includes, but is not limited to, historic tax credits, code enforcement, enforcement mechanisms that are unique to the historic district, and most importantly, respect and require due diligence on the Native American burial ground, or as otherwise stated as the Stone Street Redevelopment Area. 
The report suggests that only use of federal funds will provide protection, which is true, but that only happens when federal funds are used and not all development and demolition is federally funded. For some reason, one of the most important historical landmarks in our city, Atwood Stadium, was recommended for removal, a single site designation to be sought. However, we fail to see the logic in delisting a resource that already has a designation, only to go through the process of relisting. This makes absolutely no sense. In Civic Park, experts were consulted to review the historic districts, its integrity, the structures, and the area wide impact. This report was used by the City of Flint, the Historic District Commission, the State of Michigan, and the Genesee County Land Bank Authority. The final decision was that the boundaries would not be moved and the Historic District Commission would allow to review this document to allow specific demolitions. Why was this process not afforded to us? We require analysis by experts community engagement, and a plan that ties into the master plan for our neighborhood. And I'm going to refer to the Vice President of Carriage Town Neighborhood Association. I have, a, I have an engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Freeman. I am Vice President of the Carriage Town Historic Neighborhood Association. I also serve in a number of capacities within our community. I serve on the community, uh, the Economic Development Corporation for the City of Flint, the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority, and I also serve as a uh, trustee at Mock Community College. I have lived in Carriage Town for 21 years. My address is 225 University Avenue, Flint, Michigan. Thanks. So based on our assessment of the motivation for this effort, it has been a few that have no interest in the entire historic district. Former emergency manager Mike Brown was prompted by some of the members of the former Abbott Authority to start the process. While the following emergency manager approved the representatives, this process has not been urged by the mayor, the master plan, the city planner, former emergency manager Early, the Historic District Commission, the Planning Commission, the Neighborhood Association, Early Hospital, or Petter University. It has been a process encouraged by the city attorney and a few members of the Atwood Authority that is no longer an authority. It has been publicly recognized that this process has been flawed from the beginning, thus the title of preliminary report, and has also been referred to as a draft. Our question is, why a draft recommendation is being provided to the public for comment where the next step in the process is supposed to be decision versus revision. And if public comment is, the only, is only to improve the analysis and recommendations, should not the purpose of this public hearing be only to provide feedback on the report and not to immediately change the boundaries? Today you may hear support uh, for this preliminary report. However, it is our assertion that those who support such a poorly crafted and factually void document are either victim to misinformation or have a personal and or professional agenda and do not have the, in the interests of the entire district at heart. We, the board and residents of the Carriage Town Historic Neighborhood Association, respectfully request that this process be abandoned. We require code enforcement, zoning compliance, and nuisance abatement. <coughs> the lack of these, compounded by the current institutional ownership, has been the source of light in the entire neighborhood not the historic designation. We have recently met with city leadership and Kettering University about ways that we can partner. While Hurley, Hurley has refused to acknowledge their culpability in this matter and did not send a representative to the meeting, we are more than willing to work with them on planning, property assessment, and potential selective demolition where necessary. But any concession or activity should ensure a benefit to the entire historic district the Native American burial ground, and the future of this neighborhood. We appreciate your time and attention to this matter and welcome additional dialogue on how the community can reach a consensus in this matter of light illumination and neighborhood stabilization. Thank you. City of Flint, I own property in the Carriage Town Historic District. 
here today representing the Genesee County Historical Society and the Grant Dark Carriage Company Foundation, which owns the restored national landmark, the Grant Dark Carriage Company headquarters at 316 Water Street in the Carriage Town Historic District. We wish to go on record to fully support the Carriage Town Neighborhood Association uh, in their statement. Um, and we feel uh, that uh, the modification of Carriage Town boundaries uh, should not be done. The report was not done in accordance with Public Act 169 of 1970 as amended. And the report spoke little about the history we are trying to preserve. Rather, it focused on the desire of nearby institutions wishing to clean up life through demolition. Anyone who is familiar with the historic district, and I will say that I was chairman of the historic district for many years, knows that demolition is allowed in our, in our, in our historic districts. Um, the, um, the ordinance is not prohibiting it, and it doesn't encourage blight. As a resident, I have restored seven structures in Carriage Stop myself over the last 30 years. Um, I know that the Carriage Stop Neighborhood Association has always been about improving the neighborhood and getting rid of blight. But we've had a constant problem with the city of Flint um, building inspections on enforcing the codes to make people clean up their properties. And probably with the one biggest problem that we've had is Hurley Hospital. The Historic District Commission has had issues with Hurley because they bought 14 properties in the Historic District, knowing that it was in the Historic District and knowing the city ordinance, uh, pro prohibited um, outright demolition, um, and their project failed. Now, in, the, in most cases, they would be forced to sell the property to somebody else, but they held on to that property. All these properties were occupied uh, when they took them over, um, and over the last 20 years, they have just deteriorated because they have not maintained it. And in fact, the Neighborhood Association has went in and cleaned properties up for them. Um, but now we hear that people want to delist this because they want to tear the properties down. We feel that they should be held accountable. Um, and like other people in the historic district, um, they should be forced to clean up the blight in, in the neighborhood. The one item that I think is overlooked here is that the whole purpose of the historic district um, ordinance is to protect our heritage. We have less than 800 structures in our city identified as historic structures and protected for the future. That's a small amount when you consider all the buildings um, that we once had in the city. The Historic District Ordinance is the only ordinance that protects fully the structures. Designation as a federal designation only protects it from federal funds being used on that structure. <coughs> so with a city ordinance, anybody doing work on the exterior or on the streetscape of the Historic District has to come before the Commission and have it reviewed. Um, and we feel that this is necessary because there is still a lot of history in this area that deserves to be protected. The Market Street Fire Station, which will soon be turned into a group of, and was fully restored back in the 1980s. Next door to that is the um, last 20th century automobile factory in the city of Flint, the Dork Motor Car Factory. We have over eight houses in this portion of this historic district that have been restored with federal funds using almost a half a million dollars in the last six years. We feel, because an effort was made to restore these properties, that they should be protected for the future generations to follow us. We also have Abbott Stadium, which has been uh, a Flint gem for, for many, many years. Five minutes. Uh, done. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Steven's uh, from here. <coughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So the, the city has three choices in regard to the historic district in Town. Uh, it can engage in code enforcement, requiring property owners to redevelop their property or impose fines. Um, in all likelihood, this may only result in more abandoned unit and the exorbitant cost of redevelopment will be beyond the means of existing owners within the foreseeable future. Uh, the, the, the investment that would be required by, by a difficult property owner would, would be so far beyond the, the, the actual value of the property that most property owners in the neighborhood have not, have, have not um, improved their, their property. And it's become a consensus that, in fact, the historic district has done more to impede preservation of historic buildings than to preserve them. Uh, if you look at other comparable neighborhoods with historic homes in them, uh, compared to Carriage Town, they're in better condition um, with more historic homes still uh, standing. Um, so if, if, if the goal of the historic district is to preserve historic homes, the historic district designation has utterly failed in character. Um, you can also engage its development agencies and partners using powers such as eminent domain if necessary and put together a broad strategy for reclamation of the valuable historic homes within the district. Um, and Flint Public Art Project is willing to partner in this can support grants, serve as an end user, and participate in stakeholder meetings, and contribute to a vision for that project. Um, as the owner of, of a building on the corner of Stone and University, um, we've been present in Town for about three years. Uh, we also have a lease purchase agreement with the Town Neighborhood Association. Um, and have offered to partner with Carriage Town in the development of the plan for the expansion of that project to incorporate as many homes as we could absorb within, within our framework. Um, so, you know, we believe that the existing homes could be put to use in our vicinity on Stone Street. Um, However, the, the, the cooperation on the part of the Carriage Town Neighborhood Association has been lacking um, our requests for support for grants, um, signing letters in support of programs and grants has uh, received no response. Um, and um, our development project for the Spencer's Art House uh, has received threats from the Carriage Town Neighborhood Association for taking contrary positions to their stand on the historic district. Um, given uh, the Carriage Town's current executive board's uh, uh, disposition, uh, we don't um, see uh, them as being a critical partner in the redevelopment. Is this relevant to the issue? Uh, I mean, you said that this is supposed to be about the study committee, and he's talking about a grant that he has with the Neighborhood Association? How is it? Half a minute, sir. Uh, Bill needs two options. It can change the boundaries of the historic district, allowing existing user users, uh, existing owners, to demolish buildings beyond repair built and filled in other sites and create individual historic home designations where justified to continue preserving what can be preserved. Uh, Flint Public Art Project believes this third option is the most likely to be flexible enough to produce the much needed neighborhood changes and is likely to result in more, not less, preservation of existing buildings. Thank you, sir. 
And so I would like to see the historic district boundaries remain. I would also like the city to take the recommendations and the position of the Mis Michigan Historic Preservation Network as they are our statewide uh, organization that guides us in historic preservation and in following the Secretary of Interior guidelines that are set up for historic districts. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Do we have any additional public speakers? Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, My name is Tim Monahan. I was a member of the uh, Boundary Review Committee. I live at 616 Bergola Street, in Flint, um, which is in Georgetown. Um, I've, I've uh, never argued that the Curley Hospital has been a, a prime problem with, uh, with nine of, eight or nine of these houses up there. I've never argued that. In fact, I successfully sued Curley Hospital. And they cut the grasses up there because I, I have a court order, or I got a court order that made them do that. Um, I sat as president of the Carriage Neighborhood Association for five years. Um, and uh, in that time, uh, most of the NSP money, all, that, all the NSP money, all those programming uh, were done. And it was wonderful to watch that. At the same time, I have a house in Carriage Town that I paid $40,000 for. Now to do the roof cost more than the house is appraised for. Because in order to sell the house or have a house in Carriage Town that is worth $30,000, you have to have $160,000 worth of work done to it. In other words, you have to have a new roof and new windows, new siding, new driveways, new plumbing, and be LED certified. That house is worth $40,000. Know? Um, so it, it would be nice to say, I, I would love to see a early hospital or someone come up with a redevelopment plan for these houses. I really would. At the same time, I look at houses down below, uh, fourth, or down, down around Abbott Stadium, um, and, and I know a, a, a gentleman that literally abandoned his house because the cost of the roof was more than it cost him to buy a new house with a new roof. Um, and, and that house is sitting there with a big hole in the back. And that house, is like, like the house next to me or the house behind me um, on the corner there, is going to sit and it's going to deteriorate for, for, for well, who knows? I don't know how long. That said, the Boundary Review Committee did, did look at, um, you know, and it even mentions that there are 66 or something, some 66 empty lots in this area. Um, and that Carriage Town is not federally recognized at all because it doesn't, it, it lacks the original housing stock um, that's required to be a federally recognized historic district. Um, most of the lots below the University Avenue west of, or west of Grand Traverse down uh, south of Stone Street, all the way to Water Street, uh, were, 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 were houses. They were lots. They were small houses. Um, a lot of people remember that. Um, they're gone now. They're empty. These are all empty lots. Uh, if you really, if you really evaluate it, Carriage Town itself might actually be a much more stable neighborhood if we cut this cancerous side off. If we removed all these empty properties. Do we now have, um, does Carriage Town now, now meet that 65% federal uh, requirement? That's a number that the committee looked at, and we thought, well, this isn't really in our purview to do this. This is, a, you know, someone needs to be a mathematician to do that. It's a number that we can come up with relatively simply, actually, you know, do an inventory of Carriage Town um, and, and look at what would Carriage Town be better served if it didn't have all these empty properties. Hey, that said, I would love to see someone redevelop and rebuild these houses that are early hospitals. They are gorgeous. They were gorgeous gems. You know, I watched one on the corner of Fourth Avenue of Stone. It got hit by a tree seven years ago. Small hole in the roof. I notified early hospital. That hole now the whole porch roof has collapsed onto the thing, and it's a dangerous, dangerous situation. It doesn't take long for a house to deteriorate. We also evaluated a report from Row Engineering about some of these houses that also stated that these houses were, um, <clears throat> there were significantly, significant structural problems with a lot of these houses. You know, and that really wasn't in our purview, I guess, uh, you know, according to the state report. The state report did say, by the way, that maybe what we need to look at is the entire historic district altogether. The state report did say that, and the state report at the very end did state this, this decision is a local decision. This isn't a state decision. This isn't a federal decision. This is a local decision. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank
Before the next uh, public speaker speaks, I'd just like to remind the audience and all public speakers that the purpose of the meeting is to assist, provide input and comment that will assist the committee in improving the report and improving their recommendations. So if we could please remain germane to the topic <laughs> of providing, providing input as it results to the actual report, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. My name is John McGeary. I live at 1115 Lafayette Street, Flint, Michigan. I've been a resident of the city of Flint for 40 years. I'm here speaking totally on my own, not representing any entity. Um, I was I'm speaking, I wanted to kind of share a historical perspective. I was the project manager for Carriage Town when it started over 33 years ago. I'm a strong supporter of Carriage Town. I think it's got tremendous potential in the future. I'm excited about a lot of the projects that still could occur. Like one of the things that close to my heart is that no one talks about is there's a lot of buildings in the eastern part of the district that are still waiting to be restored. Um, my number one favorite is the uh, 1920s Art Deco Buick showroom that's now covered by a modern stucco-like structure where six old, I think it's at Horner University in, in uh, Saginaw Street. But anyway, 33 years ago, the area in question was viable. Uh, there were a lot of nice houses in the area, um, but in the 33 years since, all the, almost all the redevelopment has occurred east of Grand Traverse. Um, what once was a staple area now is characterized by horribly deteriorating structures. And I, up on the board, on the front table, there's 33 photos that I have. If anybody wants to look at them, that shows the, the, the serious state of disrepair of these structures. They're they're not only um, hard to look at, but they're serious magnets of crime. One of the, one of the Crime strategies of that whole area is a concept called crime prevention through environmental design. And it looks at vacant structures as one of the key magnets to crime and a key magnet to continue to further, uh, causes a further blight in the neighborhood. Clearly, looking back in hindsight, as a former project manager for Carriage Town, we bit off more than we could chew. The development has occurred east of Sag with a, except, a few exceptions of some homes that because we had some federal funds, they were not at all historic preservation jobs, the homes that were referred to earlier. They're nice homes now. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent to restore them. But if you remember, they were stripped down to the bone where there is no historic fabric left to them whatsoever. That is not historic preservation. But my, my main point is, the redevelopment of Carriage Town, I think, should be focused in the area east. I think the reference of a previous speaker that maybe it's a little over the top, but referring to that area west of um, Grand Traverse is a cancer that maybe needs to be removed for the health of the whole body. I think maybe a good analogy. The State Preservation Office criticism of the report seems to be more structural than anything else. As the earlier speaker indicated, they said they're not necessarily saying they're opposed to a boundary change, but the way the report was written needs some corrections. Today's paper also indicated the same, uh, referred to that same report, and the very bottom line of the article was this is a local decision to be made. And I think for the uh, overall health of the entire neighborhood, um, that I fully support this proposed boundary reduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. The next speaker, please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Adam Garrick's uh, 626 Stone Street. I find it really uh, interesting that any of this is going on because all these notices that went out never made it to my mailbox or my other neighbors' mailboxes that actually live on Stone Street. Tim. They knew we lived there, and nobody asked us. Now, we're talking about the history of that, that four block area. First of all, you have the very first black owned mortuary, the failed uh, Spencer's Art Project that's got over $150,000 spent on it with no building permits. Then you've got the uh, 
burning ground or massacre, depending on how you want to look at it and what historical reference you, you look at. So if we exclude that area, just on those two points alone, I personally think it just extends this racist policy that's been going on for a long time. A lot of people that are sitting in this room help strip those houses. And now they're here to talk about how that area is a cancer. When 15 or 20 years ago they were here talking about how they wanted to save it and stop Hurley Medical Center from tearing it down. I have a $250,000 piece of cardboard hanging on my wall from when Heartland Manor was nothing but a mess and some consultant, consulting firm had been paid to assess the area uh, to rebuild the nursing home. And that $250,000 cardboard model ended up trashed in the trashed lobby of Heartland Manor. So uh, there's a lot of stinking hypocrisy in this room, reeking hypocrisy in this room. It should not be removed. Most importantly, in my opinion, as far as Flint history goes, at University of Begol, that was Mayor Aljo's house. That was a mayor's house. So you have a mayor's house, the first black mortuary, and a Native American burial ground. It would be completely offensive to remove from the historic district boundaries. I'd just like to point out, you know, with that in mind, we venerate all these industrial leaders downtown and the uh, sit-down strikes, uh, that, that uh, the plaque that's supposed to be recognizing it down by Kettering there, it's been trashed, and nobody's, nobody's bothered to clean it up. Yeah, we're here to talk about history. This is hypocrisy. Hurley should be held responsible. The city should be held responsible. And it just simply shouldn't be removed. I'm sure there's people that hate me standing in this room right now that totally agree. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Duncan Beagle, and uh, born and raised in Flint. I work in Flint probably 10 to 12 hours a day, but I know a lot of the Fenton area. And I uh, just want to bring some common sense to this. <laughs> I'm a baseball fan. I know the history of uh, Detroit Tigers and Tiger Stadium uh, probably better than anybody. I can't begin to tell you how I wrestled with whether to tear down Tiger Stadium and build a new ballpark. Uh, because I, I am one that appreciates history. But I'll tell you what, as I went back and forth, back and forth, I realized Tiger Stadium served it well, but it was time for something that uh, could serve that community better. I've been involved in the Atwood Stadium project for 20 years. And the only reason I really got involved was because it was sitting there empty for two years. And uh, then the mayor, Stanley, appointed me to say, well, you're running your mouth so much, you can be chairperson of the Atwood Stadium Authority. So my wife, to this day, still wants to spread my ashes at the 50-yard line because I spent so much time down in Atwood and going through those neighborhoods. And I can remember uh, when Mayor Williamson was and he came over to me and he said, you know, we're going to tear that one stadium down we're going to build a new stadium on the other side of the river. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, Mayor, as much as I appreciate the history of that facility, if there's money and resources to build a new stadium that'll uh, be better for this community going forward, yeah, I don't have any problem with that. And I want my colleagues to know, uh, David White, Michael Freeman, Leanne Marcus, Heather Bernash, the attorney, I respect where they're coming from. In fact, we're on the same page. We all want to see Flint go forward. And I love their passion and just happen to respectfully disagree with them. Now let's get down to the bottom line. Yes, I've got a, if you want to call it, selfish interest in seeing the development of Atwood Stadium. I do think the day will come when hopefully we're going to have a new playing surface down there and we can invite all our friends and colleagues from everywhere uh, to come down there. And I'll tell you what, the feedback I get is there's a lot of people in suburbia that don't like coming down to Flint because of the perception of every neighborhood that's in bad shape and crime and so forth. And the only way you begin to change that is to make constructive changes. Now, I'll tell you what, I don't have any problem going in a room right now with my friends. And let's sit down. I don't think they would disagree. There's a large number of structures over in that area that need to be torn down yesterday. And what is the real interest? If it's, if it's preserving some of the houses over there, I respect that. If it's about preserving a boundary, of which I picked up last night's paper, and I think there's 11 houses 
uh, in that area, to my knowledge, where the real where the property taxes have yet to be paid. Now, if there's a viable plan, and again, I like to think I'm a reasonable person, to truly restore all of those houses in that neighborhood, then I don't think uh, I'd have any problem with sitting down and listening. But I can remember the late Dave Doherty at uh, Kettering University telling me, you know, that Third Avenue, Fifth Avenue corridor is a vital area for the rebirth and preservation of the city of Flint. And I agreed with him. And I remember him telling me, he said, whatever you do with that would either tear the dang thing down or preserve it. Don't let it just sit there. And with all due respect, so many of those houses over in that area have been sitting and sitting and sitting. And I just don't think it's reasonable to think that uh, enough money and resources are gonna come forward uh, to preserve and restore those homes. But like I said, I think there's people on both sides could probably sit in a room and maybe find some common ground. I'm willing to do that. But you know something? At the end of the day, if that can't be done, it's time to move forward for the betterment of the city of Flint. It really is, and I would be in favor of moving the boundary. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. My name is Peggy Brisbane Nablet. I live at 320 West 2nd Avenue. And I guess um, if we want to talk about a little bit of history, my home was built in 1896. Actually, one of the Fords lived in it, according to Chris. Um, and I totally agree with Judge Beagle that if we can come to a consensus about this and sit down and figure out what's going to do, but on the other hand, um, I've lived in the neighborhood for over 17 years. I love my home. Um, I've fought for my home, um, city, personally. Um, I, the reason we moved here was because of the history and all the beautiful houses. But from what I'm seeing is the houses that basically do need to be taken care of as far as because of dilapidation, they need to come down. i am just been classified as, as totally disabled, um, health-wise. Um, due to the fact that they just closed the store down. I've noticed that in my neighborhood, I can actually go out and sit in the beautiful gazebo that I put it, have erect every summer. Um, it's nice to be able to finally go out and not be, feel afraid in the neighborhood. At least that's what I'm feeling lately since it's been gone. Um, I can actually go out on my porch if I want to and do whatever. Um, I, I guess I just totally agree with Judge Beagle that if if it needs to be done, fine. If it if and it, we've been at odds for this for with this for years. Um, if the houses can be restored, okay. If they can't, get rid of them, especially the ones on Stone Street. It's it's horrible. I went to an event this last summer to, um, for the Art Institute, because they're trying to restore Spencer's. There's also a garden that they've erected there. Um, I couldn't park down the street because um, somebody that lives on that street um, is making quite an eyesore of just us parking down there so that we can enjoy our neighborhood. Um, on top of that, um, my letter came to me through the city of Flint. I don't know about anybody else, but I got my letter from the city of Flint. Tim Monahan didn't have nothing to do with that. Um, I feel that I'm going to live in my home for the rest of my life. I want to stay there. I own that house. It's mine. I'm responsible for restoring it. And if we can't take care of what's going on as far as the dilapidation, then they need to come down. And maybe it's a good thing that the federal dollars will come to us, because then I can have some work done to my home, and I can't do it on my own. I can't. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers? Again, the city greatly welcomes input from the community to help to better the recommendation. 
Hi, my name is um, Heather Bernash, and I'm a resident of the city of Flint. My address is 803 Stevens Street. Um, I've lived in the city for about 20 years now, um, in a house that was built in 1890. Um, I'm one of those people that bought a $10,000 house and put almost 200000 into it. Um, so I'm one of those fools. Um, but I'm proud of it, and I love my house, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I realize um, and appreciate the value of historic houses and what that value brings to the entire city of Flint. Um, I have a master's degree in historic preservation. I am on the Flint Historic District Commission, and I was on this uh, Carriage Town Boundary Change Committee. Um, to my knowledge, I participated in and attended um, every meeting uh, that the committee held. I might have missed one, but I, I don't recall. Um, there are some problems that I have with the process, with our meetings, and with uh, the report. Um, of the committee members, um, to my knowledge, I'm the only one that has formalized training in historic preservation. Um, also, to my knowledge, generally, it was just Mr. Monahan and myself um, that attended the meetings. Um, one of the committee members only attended the first meeting he summers or he winters in Florida and was not at most of the meetings. He was only at the first one. Um, another um, committee member, Ms. Yeager, um, indicated to us at our first meeting that because of some personal issues, she could not attend or participate in any of the meetings. And in fact, was not at a single meeting that I attended. Um, so it concerns me that when half of the committee is not present for any of the meetings, how they can sign their name to this report. And they did not participate in gathering the information or hearing any of the testimony or um, participating in any of these interviews. Um, so it concerns me the, the sincerity of, of their, their names uh, signed to this report. Um, some other problems I have with the report, the initial copy that I received, I was not involved or included in, in drafting this report. Um, only the interviews from people and entities that supported the boundary change were initially included in the report. Uh, the Neighborhood Association did participate and uh, spoke with us and opposed the change. That paragraph was not included in the initial report. I had to insist that all testimony from everyone that was interviewed be included in the report. Um, so initially the report only had people that, uh, that opposed the change. My uh, lack of support for the change was also not included in the original report. I had to insist uh, that my lack of support be noted in the report. Um, the report indicates that people were interviewed by the committee. It indicates that Michael Freeman was interviewed. It indicates that Nancy Sinclair was interviewed. Um, it indicates that Ken Van Wagner was interviewed, Philip Barnhart. I was at every committee meeting. None of these people were at any of the meetings. Um, they may have been spoken to outside of an official committee meeting by other people, um, but none of them talked to me. Um, we never did any site visits. We never walked around and looked at this area. We never discussed specific addresses. We had about four meetings in a coffee shop. That was it. Um, I don't feel like the process was adequate. Um, and I was surprised at what the recommendation was because I was never um, included in that discussion of what will be our recommendation. I just received a copy of this report like everyone else in the city of Flint. Um, so I was surprised at what the recommendation was because um, to my knowledge, there wasn't a discussion of Okay, now we have all this information, what do we decide? What is the decision going to be? Um, and being a committee member, I would think I, I should have been involved in that process Half a minute. of the decision. Um, several entities have submitted letters to the city <coughs> voicing their uh, lack of support for the recommendation of Carriage Town Neighborhood Association. Um, the Historic District Commission voted to um, also write a letter um, opposing the recommendation. The Michigan Historic Preservation Network 
um, does not support the change. The Motor Cities National Heritage Area does not support the change. The Flint Planning Commission does not support the change. The State Historic Preservation Office does not support the change. Thank you, Ms. Bernard. My name is Myron Shelton. I come from Shelton's Auto Motor, 3rd Avenue. My grandfather came here in 1850. He was a cattle buyer, brought all the cattle here in Genesee County and shipped them down to Detroit so they'd get slaughtered, which is sad. But anyway, and then my father was born in 1898. Our house was probably like the house on your, on your thing that we had demolished here a few years ago so they got burnt in the fire. But anyway, we've been in Flint longer than probably anybody else in this place today in their family, all right? And we'd like to say, the stadium's been there for a long time. I remember standing out in front watching the Arrows play baseball. And I remember trying to run after their balls and I was only about eight and the big boys ran over top of me. And I couldn't get the baseball. And I remember the I went stadium, I played football there for Central High School. We had the biggest crowd that anybody ever had that year. Bigger, and then the president did it, bigger than the Lions did. And we had over 22,000 people there at that time. So that's another history. The neighborhoods changed a lot. My buildings changed a lot. In 1928, when my dad had the station built, and there isn't any station left on the street. We had eight service centers on 3rd Avenue at one time, and now there's no service centers, no gas stations. They're all demolished and moved. At one time we had Sears and Robux. One time we had Goodyear. We had General Tiger. We had BF, BF Goodrich. They were all, they're all gone. They all moved to the suburbs. So the neighborhood's changed. Now we have to change. And the home is up there in Stone Street. Need to be changed. So we can live with some things that homes are good. Don't get me wrong. But when they're all run down, they look like crap. Down on my side, we got the teacher's credit next to me, we got Shelton's Automotive next, which is my place, and everything's clean going that way, you know? And the nice flower on University Avenue, anyway, we brought out the grand drivers there, we brought the liquor store up. That's probably the best thing that happened to our neighborhood. All of a sudden, when they took the place, the people moved, the people, other people moved. And now it's a clean place down there. You can drive by there and there's no riffraff, no more. And we're good next for a nicer deal happening. I'd like to thank Kettering for that because they did a beautiful job of getting rid of the place. And that's all. I just wanted to say I think the houses should go. Thank you very much, Mr. Shelton. Okay. Do we have any additional public speakers? Again, the city welcomes all input. My name is Nayara Sharif, and I live in Mott Park. I do not live in Carriage Town, but I am here to stand in solidarity with the um, Carriage Town Neighborhood Association. And I wanted to start, first of all, with this report. And I really question this entire process. Because usually when you are, I guess, evaluating a neighborhood, you have a housing inventory I don't know if that occurred with this, like as a foundation for this particular report, but um, there is a map stating like the, um, the, 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 the different properties, but it doesn't talk about the quality of those particular properties. Um, the second thing that I question is if this is a draft and preliminary, like, is there going to be another public hearing once our input is incorporated? Is it going to be incorporated? Um, because usually when there's public hearings, it's just like, it's, it's just about to be a done deal. And um, when we just, as a city of Flint, we just adopted our master plan. And while that was a, a fabulous process for the city as a whole to get involved, I feel like acting on this now and changing the boundaries now when you have 
resident input that has not been incorporated in people who actually live in that area and this is going to affect them every day, I think everyone needs to sit down. There was a lot of people who expressed in their, in their comments to, to sit down and hash things out and come up with a consensus. When is that going to happen? Because talk is cheap. So hopefully that will happen. It will kind of be an open and transparent process. And the people who could not be here would know the results of those particular meetings. Um, and, I, and I question, what sort of community do we want to live in? Because policies like this, it sets a tone for what our community and what we want our community to be. Because our policies, our ordinances, our decisions are a statement of our values. And what are our values as a community? Do we want to be known as the community that when the going gets tough, that we're just gonna just like cut, you know, just, just cut our losses and run? Now, I lived in a historic home. It was not a, under a historic, um, like designated historic. And that requires, I would say, a lot, many times it's labor of love. Um, I know our property values as a whole is in the toilet, and you may not ever um, recoup like the loss that you're putting into your home. But if we are, as a community, if we want to be in 20 years, like this young mobile talent or the creative class or whatever this designated population, things like historic districts are it, it has character, it adds character to a community. Now, you don't have people moving across the country and live in a track home. Like, that's not what people are, like, if we want to attract the sort of people that we say that we want to attract, then we need to be, we need to, with our values and our policies, um, demonstrate that we want to have, that we value our history. Unfortunately, a lot of our history, our past, like, we're not good at that collectively. Um, like with the I-75 I and the, the ex building the expressways and all these things, we have a lot of our history that is irrevocably lost and we can't regain that. But we have an opportunity today in 2015 to stand up collectively and say we value our history. We value the history of the common people and not necessarily the history of the industrialists and the um, in, in the large businesses. So I really hope that, number one, that this does not move forward until everyone sits down and hash things out and then bring it back to the public to have another public hearing after everything is, after everything is incorporated. Thank you. I'm William Ganey. I live in the city of Flint. I have lived in Carriage Town. Um, I'm a member of Downtown Properties. It's a little LLC that we have six houses. Um, we rent primarily to the Michigan State medical students, the student physicians. Um, I think, in fact, I think we rent to more Michigan State medical students on the Flint campus than anyone else. Um, I also am the only one who is invited to the Michigan State. Um, incoming class that's not part of the university. Um, I'm the only one that's invited. I take the students around. I also am employed occasionally by Hurley Hospital to take uh, new residents around the city of Flint. I go and take them on a four hour tour and I always take them right down to Stone Street and I tell them how that has happened with Hurley Foundation, who I believe is the one that owns most of those properties, um, has bought them and neglected them. With what Kettering University has done with the liquor store, I feel that's a game changer for that entire area. I feel it's viable as long as 75 or 80% of those houses are fixed up, I could rent them. There's a big uh, demand for quality houses in downtown Flint, but there's very few quality places available. Um, we get I would say great rent. We get $1,200 a month for a house. They pay all the utilities. They couldn't be happier. It's four medical students. They love it. Um, in the past, um, Flint campus, they had to force the students to come. Um, it was a lottery. 
Um, in the last couple of years, that's changed. Uh, there's actually people who are wanting to come to Flint, to this campus. And one of the things that students tell me is that they like the character of the houses. I restore the houses. Um, two of the houses are in process right now. They're just as bad as the ones on Stone Street. Um, but uh, that's what the students seem to like, they like the character of the houses, just like she had said, the previous speaker. Um, it's their unique. Um, also, it, it seems like they like them whether they're unique historically or like the polished concrete at the Michigan State uh, new uh, campus, there are those loft apartments. They just like it because it's different. But I like to encourage the players, the people that own these properties, to try to get some kind of grant to fix them up. If they can get a billion dollars for uh, the Kettering University corridor for safety, they should be able to come up with a million dollars to fix all those houses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any additional public speakers? Please come forward, any public speakers? If we have no additional public speakers, that concludes the meeting. No, I'd like to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, Paul. Go ahead. <laughs> Please state your name for the record, sir. Certainly. My name is Paul Herring. I reside at 525 Mason Street in Carriagetown. And staying germane, I want to remind everybody, this is a line on a piece of paper. It seems like in Flint, we always have to split into two camps. Those that are for and those that are against, and we fight like that. Instead of realizing that there's going to be opposition and there's going to be support, and between the two of them, we can come to a solution. Remember, it's a line on a piece of paper. I've heard those that are against the boundary change say that we lose gems like the fire station and the car factory and Atwood Stadium. It's a line on a piece of paper. Why don't we include those things to satisfy their needs? Those are very valuable historic things that maybe should stay in a, a neighborhood that has a historic designation. That's easy. It's a line on a piece of paper. And we discover that after we change this line, change this boundary, change this border, and there's not enough stock in the neighborhood to be a historically designated neighborhood, let's move the boundary north, where there are more houses that are viable. It's a line on a piece of paper. It's not that hard to come together on this. It's not that hard to come together. Really, the, the two entities that are here don't even have a, a, have a boxer in the fight. We've got some entities that want to make change on the west side of the university, and we've got an entity on the east side of the university that doesn't want that change to take place. It's a line on a piece of paper. If we keep on doing what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always gotten. 25 years I've been in Carriagetown. 25 years I've watched the neighborhood change. Whether it was arson, accident, or intentional, the stock that was there 25 years ago does not exist. So the true question is, what does it take to qualify for a national historic designation? What does it take to qualify for a state historic designation? Once we know those numbers, that line on the piece of paper can accomplish everybody's goals. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any additional public speakers? Again, the city welcomes all input. Thank you. My name is Chris Delmar. I live in Flint, Michigan. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that uh, there's the idea of uh, shrinking the district. Uh, what has gone on over the years is just simply neglect by those entities that own some of these properties, especially Hurley. It's unfortunate. They knew what they were buying and they bought these properties. Uh, and, and through their own neglect the negligence of the property, uh, many of the parcels have deteriorated. 
Uh, it would be interesting to know from the city what the true objective is and the reason why. Uh, several months ago, there was an article in the, jur in the journal, Flint Journal, about using the area that's going to be done away with in Carriage Town to use that uh, for some type of possible civic center or sports complex. That would be unfortunate. Our community over the years has just taken away many of the historical things that, that are in Flint, Michigan. I often say, thank God we're not in Rome because we would tear down the Colosseum to make way for progress. Uh, we've seen, the, I'm serious, we've seen the homes on Manning Street be torn down. We've seen the, after it became Auto World, we've seen the IMA Auditorium torn down. And then our civic leaders say, well, what could we do for, what should we do for a community center or uh, for a, uh, I, I use the term community center, uh, uh, a civic center, but we, we had just torn it down with uh, the IMA Auditorium. Uh, now we want to shrink this area. Um, so I would look for the, find out from the city what the true objective is. Ideally, to save carriage town, there is, in my estimation, one way to do that. And many of you are familiar with the movie, If You Build It, They Will Come, referring to Field of Dreams and the baseball diamond. I say, if you move it, they will come. And that would be to move the Genesee, uh, the, uh, um, excuse me for a minute, uh, to move the uh, Crossroads Village to that part of town. To have a study done to see what it would cost to move those buildings into Carriage Town, close off those areas as a living community, and it would bring people to downtown Flint. Uh, so it, it would take care of several objectives uh, bring people to Flint, save the area, and at the same time save uh, uh, Crossroads Village. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Any additional public speakers? Uh, Freeman Greer, and I live in 3324 Glen Avenue, Genesee Township. Um, I'm a former resident of the city of Flint, but unfortunately in the 2008 recession, um, I was hit pretty hard in regards to the recession, losing my job, going into bankruptcy, you know, feeling the pain of an economic collapse. Um, at that time, I had purchased the Stockton Center, which is a historic district now. And I went through the last 10 years of my life renovating it and fixing it up. And it is now a stable, property. It is a local historic district. It is a state historic district. And it is nationally eligible. This was the home of Colonel Stockton, um, Civil War, 16th Michigan Regiment. Um, a, he married Maria Smith, the youngest daughter of Jacob Smith, who was a founding European that settled this area. The youngest daughter and the Smith family um, also had James Longstreet move in and, and marry into the Smith family. So now we have the Confederacy and the Union both represented at the Stockton Center. Um, the reason that's important is because it's the history of our city. And what the district for Carriage Town represents is the history of our city. If you take these things away, then we forget who we are. And what we can do as a city is build together. Um, I'm back. <laughs> I had to move away for a while, to move my business out of the city, and now I am back in the city, working in the city, back in the Stockton, 
developing and working with the community to enrich the environment so that we can all have a prosperous city and work together. Um, the buildings that exist in the district now, Atwood, the fire station, the, the only building left from the Cambridge factory, the houses up on Stone Street I've walked through, I've looked at them, I've seen them with structural engineers. Are they salvageable? Yes, with a lot of work. Work is a good thing. We need work. That puts people to work. Can we do it? Absolutely. Look at Detroit. What are they doing? Rebuilding. What should we be doing? Rebuilding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Any additional public speakers? Any additional public speakers? Don't be shy. Any additional public speakers? Can I talk twice? Nice <laughs> try. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, I'd like to thank everyone very much for coming out this morning, taking an valuable time. Your comments were greatly appreciated. And this meeting is now adjourned.